I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Y'all grab a chair this morning. Uh, well, wasn't really thinking about that. <laughs> Honestly, I was just thinking about being more fit at 40. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that was kind of been my, my thought process in the last uh, little while. But thank you. Um, very honored. Really, that just very special. Um, but <clears throat> can we jump into the word? Just easier uh, for me to be in that place than maybe some, maybe some things that maybe feel a little bit more uh, uncomfortable, awkward, whatever. Um, but really, I believe that even what was just those things that were done right there was really along the lines of the same message today. And uh, that is about relational, being relational. Um, Father, we just thank you today for your word. We thank you that you've brought us here. We thank you that you've joined people. Father, we thank you for those that you're joining. We thank you that you're building up your body. Um, we thank you for unity in your body. We thank you for restoration, uh, where, there, where there would maybe be a, a schism. Father, we thank you for healing uh, of wounds. Father, we thank you for um, just a flow of your grace and unity in your body, one body. And we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to take a, take a moment. Um, uh, it's so funny. I was trying to get my notes uh, ordered out, and I was having some problems this morning with my computer. Came here early thinking it was going to be just real simple. But it ended up not being. Um, and I remember thinking, I don't even know that I should write notes anyway, because it's just stuff all right here. And uh, so I have this whiteboard up in my office, and I started with this thing that kept coming, kept coming up, com coming up to me, and uh, and then it just kind of threw up on the board. And I thought, how do you make sense of that? Um, but what it really comes down to is is um, a lot of different things that that we've already been talking about. But really, I wanted to address something about going back to the first. How many of you remember that's what we started on the first? And um, how many of you have seen uh, maybe on, maybe online or maybe um, maybe some, maybe it's through Facebook or whatever about the revival that's going on or the okay so how awesome is that um, the pour, uh, outpouring of God's spirit in, in a place and we know that when God pours out His spirit there's always people added to the body of Christ there's restoration there's change and there's things that are, that are happening um, that's not the first time the, the, the spirit of God's been poured out. And I thought it would be good for us to look at, um, to look at uh, the first time. The first time. Because, um, sadly enough, uh, when you see God moving um, in, in, in anywhere, anyway, there, there tends to be critics. Um, it could be in a college over where you haven't been, we haven't been, or maybe there's just a video or along those lines, or it could be in a church with somebody uh, weeping on their knees or maybe giving a shout or maybe taking off running, because whatever it might be, um, and you could chalk that up as emotionalism, you could chalk it up as whatever you decide to chalk it up as, um, and stand in that place of critique and... Uh, and it's not really, it, it, but, and, and not only that, it, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. There's supposed to be unity in the body, one body. And uh, God's coming back for a glorious church. Not that church and this church and this church and that church, but the church. Because it says in Ephesians, there's one body, there's one Lord, there's one Savior, there's one faith, there's one. Somebody say one. one. Kind of sounds like first, doesn't it? So there's one, and, um, and so I wanted to follow up really, uh, I was thinking, how could I follow up in, in this, uh, this, this series of that I've been doing at first, and really, it really made sense to me. Um, last week, we talked about schedule me a wake-up call. You make that call before you go to bed, schedule me a wake-up call, um, and we talked about how uh, you, 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 you're intentional to not, uh, to, to, to not trade what you want um, most for what you want now, and we were, we were just, we, and so I'd encourage you to go back and just listen, but uh, 
I'll tell you what, it's just so important that we, uh, that we set the alarms in our life so that we are doing what we, we really want. It's so easy. We looked at, don't get so caught up in the day-to-day. We, we looked in the message, I think it was Romans, uh, maybe 12 or Romans 8, can't remember, um, but where he says, don't get so caught up in the day, you know, everything that's going on in this world that you forget about what God's doing, right? Um, be up and alert and active, right? Because uh, God is putting on his finishing touches. Uh, I thought it was interesting uh, this morning. It wasn't on my notes on my board, but I found myself talking uh, or, or, or really um, looking at First Peter chapter 4, uh, where it talks about each one of you has been given a gift. Um, but, I, I, you know, it's always nice to read in context. Uh, and and I, I'm going to read that. I, I put it on the bottom of my notes. I think it's on the very bottom, actually. My notes, yeah, First Peter chapter 4, and I thought it was interesting as I went up, because really what I was talking about is verse 10, but verse 7, it says, the end of all things is near. I thought that was interesting, that it just seemed like that kind of jumped off the page to me a little bit. Um, and we know that, that this is, uh, this is what, what the first time, the, uh, the outpouring of the Spirit of God, uh, we see in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus told the disciples, right, his disciples, not just his 12, right, or 11 at that time, you know, and one replaced them. Um, but, but 500 or so and 120 were in upper room. This is Acts chapter 1 and 2. Uh, and Jesus said, hey, wait here, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you'll receive power to be a witness. A witness is to testify, and we've been talking about that, about how iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. There's a testimony that we're to be given, you know, to one another, uh, even, I don't know what Joe's, uh, Joe Costello is going to be talking about at Frontline, but it's the, it said the things unsaid. I thought, hmm, I wonder if some things need to be said on some things, and we leave them unsaid. There's so many places we could go, but I wanted to just go back to um, the first, the first time we see the, the outpouring of the Spirit of God, because um, when things are going on, um, you can desire uh, and wish that you could have that. You could uh, be jealous. You could be. All, there's so many different things that you could. You see people, maybe uh, you know wh- whatever it might be. And as a pastor, you know, uh, a leading uh, a part of the body of Christ, a, a church, uh, or a piece, or shepherding a flock, rather, um, you say, Lord, is there anything I'm supposed to be doing here? So, um, but the thing about it is, is that's the outpouring of the Spirit, right? So. Um, and he said, yeah, go back to the first. And so I found myself looking in that place. And uh, how many of you know, in today's day and age, um, we don't like to go back to the first. We like to evolve to the, the better. Okay. And uh, even so, like in Revelation, John wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said, uh, do again, do again the things you once did when you first fell in love. So he didn't say, I want, you to, I want you to go get these and do this and do that and do this. I know you've never done this before, but I'm going to show you how to love Christ for the first time ever. He said, no, go back and do the things you once did. How many of you know that, that the things you once did, there are some things that were once done? Or let me say this, there are some originals that need to become the new norm or come back, you know throwback, you know, like the throwback. How many of you know, it seems like things are coming back in. They're coming. I mean, shoot, there's bell bottoms right there on the front row, right there. That was the Lord. But things are coming back around. I'm just telling you, things are coming back around. Some, 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 some truth, some foundational things that have been set in place from the very, 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 very beginning. Uh, and that's that. That's what. That's the truth. That's the bedrock. That, that's that. That's that, that. Those are those are to be not. Not only are they foundational, but those are are going to be what we hold. I believe there's there's just re a realigning back to to your roots or back to the foundation of the truth of God's word. And um, in Jeremiah chapter um, six sixteen, we've talked about this a number of times here. It talks about how when you stand at a crossroads and look, it says, "Ask for what." Ancient past. So when, when there's a place, when you're at a point of decision, like is there something I'm supposed to do? What does he say? Look back, ask for the ancient paths. And in other words, that the, the ways that God's ways, who's ancient, ancient doesn't just refer to like, you know, 
maybe great grandma, right? It refers to what has always been, and that's the ways of God. The ways of God. So really, this is what, we're, what I want to talk to you about today. And, and, um, and as you go to bed, and, and, and before you schedule a wake-up call, you do that before you go to sleep. But then you, you and I, we go to sleep, and we start, hopefully, dreaming. Dreaming is awesome. Last night, I, I don't know, I had dreams all night last night. Um, but you know how sometimes you have those nights that just dreams, you know? Um, but I, I just want to ask you this, this question this morning before we get into it. What are you dreaming What are you dreaming? Is it God's dream or is it American dream? Um, what are we dreaming? Do we know what we're dreaming? Uh, it'd be good for us to reflect in that. And even as the, we're talking about, um, again, uh, just the, the outpouring of God and going back and look that we're seeing maybe over there, what is it that we're to be looking for? Uh, we're to be hungering after one thing. And the Lord says this, uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. So their righteousness is God's way. So there are some things that we'll look at here in a moment that are God's way. And, and how many of you know when God first does something, the way he does something might be the way he wants to do something? Before there was a lot of connotation of man and, and all of this, how many of you know we can royally screw some things up? Right? How many of you know we want to know all of God's plan for our life? But God's like, I can't give you more than just like this much because you would take it, you know, take it to the ditch somewhere. And, uh, and so, again, so I, this is what we're to hunger for right here, God's way. So if you find yourself desiring, uh, he, he doesn't say, oh, desire that there would just be a move of God. Just desire his way. Because see, so many times we can pray or desire things that we don't, that we just think we, it's just, it's not even accurate prayers, right? It's not even accurate desires. There's desires that we're looking for and we're making we're in, in judgment or disappointment. Have you ever been there where you're asking God for a specific thing and you think God should do it this way and because he doesn't do it this way, now you're disappointed, you're frustrated, you're offended. I mean, you know? And, and so what, something that would be a work of God that was started as a work of God, and you got, got to, you're, you're excited and encouraged, but now you made up in your mind what you want God to do, because he works for you, right? No, no, right? No, he doesn't work for us, right? We are, we are his sent ones into this earth, okay? Um, we are, as Christ making his appeal, through us, and so this is one of the greatest things we could be doing right now as a church. Let's hunger, let's hunger for righteousness, God's way. Now, righteousness is not just uh, free from sin. Righteousness is simply God's way, and we talked about this a few, maybe even a little bit last week, but even on a Wednesday night, mirror mirror, about love. God's way is love, and and. God's way is what he prefers. And this is where, and if you're going to find out what he prefers, you're going to have to ask him, chocolate or vanilla, this or that. This is why Jesus drew in the sand. This is why at the well, he was, you know, he, this is why God is a lamb, but he's a lion, but he's a fire, but he's a cloud. Like, you understand what I'm saying? At one point, he's telling uh, th this woman, neither do I accuse you, not go and sin no more. Another one, he's telling a, a different woman, he's like, yeah, yeah. You've had this guy, and you had this guy. You remember John, and you remember Benny, and you remember Bob, and this guy right now that you're with? Well, that's not your husband, so you better go tell. And he's just calling it all out, right? And she's like, I perceive you're a prophet. Like, what, what, what? I mean, he's, he's, he's gentle, but yet he takes whips and drives people out of a temple. This goes to preference, right? So hunger and after God's way. So let's look at this. I, want, I think felt like it was... Um, this is not in our notes at all. This is just, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 2, or let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And he says, you will receive power, Acts 1, 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God wants his message of the good news of the gospel, which is that Jesus paid a price for you and me when we couldn't. He wants that message to be carried with boldness and love, speaking the truth in love in Alma, Fort Smith, in Arkansas, in America, 
and the rest of the earth. Sometimes when things are going on in other places, what we think about is, why, what about here? But just to make sure we, we celebrate that God, what God's doing. In Judea, right, like right here, right there, right there, right there, right there. I think it's so cool to, to say God's moving. He's doing, his people are doing what they've been called to do. All right. Now, what we see here is um, in Acts chapter 2, uh, we see that, that there's an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And, and now it goes out into the streets. And uh, this is where uh, the Bible talks about how like, there was as tongue, the fire set, resting upon the heads of the people, a sound of a, set the sound as of a mighty rushing wind. We don't know that it was a rushing wind. We know that it was spirit. That word wind is pneuma, still, breath, wind. It's, you can't see it, but you can see its effects, right? Isn't that so cool? You can't see the Holy Spirit, but you sure can see his effects when the comforter is near and, and you and I are yielded to and, you, and, and, and administering gifts of the Spirit. You, you can see the effects of him working, right? Anyway, um, so here you see that there's, that there's out in the streets and, and this, all of a sudden, as you know, something has changed because the one that denied Jesus, right, three times, is now testifying to everybody. And how many of you know this isn't too long after uh, people are going to be thrown in jail? There's, pretty, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden he's like, yeah, hey, this is this. And yeah, all of a sudden he's, he could be thrown in jail, but he's not thinking that at all, there's a power or a strength to be a witness, right? To, to testify of, 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 what, uh, of what God is doing, what he's done. And he says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And he talk, goes on to talk about how pour not my spirit on your sons and daughters and like, okay, all this kind of stuff. So we, could, we can expect this because we have a word of God for this, okay? And now I want to just reiterate that in, in your and my life, um, when you, when, you, when you get God's word on something, you have grounds to believe him for it. And so this is not something that you have to try to manufacture or just wait. Like, like God, thank you that you said you would do this. So now you don't have to, 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 to beg for something. You just put them in remembrance of the word, like the Bible tells us. Put, just put them in, in and, and also yourself in remembrance of that he's, he's one that keeps his word, too. But it goes on to say this, and this is where I wanted to really uh, take, take a moment, and it really it goes right into what I was writing in there. And in Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 42, and we're going to read through, um, we're going to read through 47. And it says, they devoted themselves uh, to the apostles. Okay, so this is after uh, they're out in the streets, and, and Peter gives this message, and many people are saved. All of a sudden, because that's what happens when the Spirit of God gets poured out. See, uh, the move of God always brings about the work, uh, the work of God, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, that is the building up of the body of Christ. This is what God is working on in this earth, and that is the building of the body of Christ. God's not busy working on giving people goosebumps. God's not busy, you know, uh, in a sense, building houses or... or whatever it might be, or he's, he's busy building his church. Now, as, as, he, as you're about his business, he's taking care of your business, but his business, remember, his business is building his church. That's God's business. And if you, as you take care of his business, he'll take care of your business, but let's be about what his business is, and that's building the church. So now let's see here what happens when the Spirit of God is pour, pour, uh, poured out. It says they devoted themselves to the, this is Acts 2.42, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We jumped over a word there that we often miss. And it was at the very beginning. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I want to talk today on fellowship. The dream of, what are you dreaming again? I want, us, I want us to dream of fellowship. Fellowship. This word fellowship, koinonia. This word fellowship, a common unity. They, 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 came under, they're, they're, they came under, they're hearing, teaching, they're growing, but there is a common cause that all of them are, are coming together for. There's a common cause, and you and I, there's a common cause. 
There's a common cause, and that is the building up of the body of Christ. This is your and my cause. This is your and my call. We've talked a lot about this as of late, but 2 Corinthians 5.20, it is as if God is making his appeal through you. Christ himself making his appeal. In other words, go like you, we talked about this, about how in a courtroom when somebody makes an appeal, they're challenging somebody's verdict. They're challenging somebody's judgment and saying, hey, I want to make an appeal because I want to present some new evidence. So this is what God is doing. He's using you and me to, to, and this is all of us, there's this common, there's this fellowship, there's this common goal, one body, Alma First Baptist, Kibler Baptist, United Pentecost, Trinity Beyond, what? Now, can we get mixed up on some things and, and have divisions? Yes, and that's not what God wants. He wants us to be about the, his, building up his body. Now, now, now and, and, and it's okay if the finger's the finger and the toe's the toe, because that's what we're supposed to be. We're not, there's not uniformity, but there is to be unity. And that is the building up of the body. So you and I have this opportunity and every person has been set here on this earth with his call and he's giving gifts. We'll see this here in a moment that God gave you and me gifts. In Ephesians chapter 4, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to you and me. He gave you and me, it, was, it says grace or gifts or charisma or cheris is what it is, but it's where we get the word charisma in the English. But he gave you and me gifts for what? For the building up of the body. You have a gift to bring or to, assim- to build, to assimilate and build up one body, his body, and to bring, to bring us all into, that pl- into a place not only of unity, but it would be as if even that unity is causing other people to be able to see something. You're making an appeal to where they're making a different call. All right, let's keep going here. So, or not Ephesians, but let's go. Acts chapter 2, 42. He said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. There's a fellowship. There's, there's, there's something you and I are to be about. You know, I think about that. Reach one. Reach one with what? Reach, reach one with the love of God today. Reach one. Re, this, this fellowship. What are, you, what, are you, what, what are we doing? What are, what are we doing? What are we, I've heard people say this. As, as a, 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 sitting, I've heard this come back to me. What are we doing as a church? Well, hopefully we're reaching. Hopefully. What are we doing? To the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I just wanted to speak this morning on fellowship. That's it. Go with me, if you will, to... Um, oh, oh, this is so good. Because fellowship uh, takes, it takes you and me being about what God's about, not just what we're about. How many of you know it's easy for us to... We, we did a message years ago along these lines. But it's easy to exchange fellowship for cruise ship. It really is super easy to just make that exchange because fellowship is about is, is understanding that there's, the, there's, there's something when I come into same proximity, just like we talked about as iron sharpens iron. When I come into fellowship, when I come to when I come together, um, we're, we're, there's going to be things that are going to be going on. Uh, we might rub on each other a little bit. This is why it's so important to assemble. But not just to assemble, but to serve and not just to serve, but be accountable for when you say you're going to serve. Because this right here is where we get to practice for out there. (laughs) Because uh, Jesus doesn't need advertising. It's his body that needs a better name. Everyone loves Jesus. But his body, eh, not so much. I will give you this, this passage. We just read it. If you've been reading our, our Bible reading, if you, ha- if you haven't been reading it, hey, this is, uh, you, you should start. You know, because it's one way that you can be accountable. You know, it's, it's one way that you can be accountable. And I know in this American dream, again, what are you dreaming? The American dream is I want to I make enough money so I can do whatever I want. I'm dreaming that I don't have to be accountable. I'm not accountable at a job. I'm not accountable to no one. 
Nobody can tell me what to do. I can do whatever, whenever, however, wherever I want. That's fundamentally opposed, if you think about the American dream. That's fundamentally opposed to take up your cross and follow me. Think about that. Fundamentally opposed, completely edit, completely opposed to take up your cross and follow me. American dream, I want to get to where I could, no, no one can tell me what to do. We're seeing this, and I was listening to a message um, uh, by, by, by Craig Rochelle's leadership podcast, and there's a, uh, a gentleman, I can't say his name that well, uh, Lincioni, but he talks about five dysfunctions of a team. Anyway, they were, there was a little small talk section where they said, oh, hey, buddy, hi, hi, you know, the beginning part, but there was this little piece in there that just my ears perked up, and it had to do with the workforce. And it's not just the workforce, it's our culture since 2020. Um, and it had to do with how people, uh, we've become transactional instead of relational. Transactional instead of relational. So transaction versus fellowship. Or transaction versus relational. Religion versus, versus family or versus fellowship. Relational or transactional? Let me just tell you this. God's church is a relational church. God's church is not just a transactional church. What do I mean by that is? In the workforce, so much of our work is done where we're just getting the job done and so we can get our paycheck so we can do what we want to do. Right? And you're saying, well, isn't that what we always do for work? Well, even more so now, what's happening is, and if you are a business owner, you'll find that more, peop more and more people, and you might be saying this for yourself as well, Oh, man, are you going to come into the office? Well, I hope not. I hope I don't have to make the commute. I hope I can just work from home. And what they've seen is, is it, it not only have costs gone up, but production has actually waned. And why production has waned? No accountability. But not only no accountability, no strengthening of the, other, of the people with you where there's a common goal. And so the, the reality is it's, it's, the, it's the enemy at work. Isolate and destroy. Isolate and destroy. They're seeing their companies are, 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 are beginning to atrophy because of the isolation and because, because of the separation, right? And so there's disconnect and there's not a same goal, a common cause. And so there's all this about recasting vision and redoing this and re-energizing. We need to have people come back into the office. They're like, we need to go to work again. You know, there's this, this idea that, that we need to maybe do what we once did and, and, and that's go to work instead of just, you know, go to meeting in our underwear. You know, how many of you know when you have to get ready? How many of you know when you're accountable? And so what we, and they, they just made this real quick statement. I had to rewind it like tons of time and, and, and we're, we're trading convenience and comfort for truth and growth. And I was like, Right there. That was it. As the church, we just, well, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to do church online. Because then, if I just do church online, I can do what I want, when I want, where I want. And if I don't like what the pastor is saying, I can just click it to the next thing. Instead of, at least here, I have to get up and everyone has to maybe go, are they going to the bathroom again? You know, there has, there, there's this decision that you and I have to make to consciously uh, it, it really ignore what's going on when you're, when you're here, when you come together. But not only that, you have to see some people, like maybe your ex-wife. Well, I don't go to church anymore because my ex-wife goes to church. What? What? Or a friend, maybe not, maybe not ex-wife, but like ex-friend, you know, the one that talked bad about me or that told me the truth or whatever, and, I, and that's why I don't go to church. I don't go to church because I'm going to have to learn to do what? Walk in love? So, so what's happening is I, I'm exchanging convenience and comfort for truth and growth, and I would actually have to face myself. Because like wherever I am, there I am. That's what's crazy. And, and, and so like at home, there's a culture that I create for myself, and it's great. Until somebody else comes in it. And then I realize it's not so great. And is it because they're in it, or is it because I'm in it? 
And so I'm trading convenience and comfort, good things, a bowl of beans, for a birthright. Truth and growth. Truth and being built up. God wants, he's building his church. He, but it is as if Christ himself is making his appeal through us. Christ himself is making his appeal, but I can't even be patient because I don't practice it. This is practice. We're, we're working on layups today. Oh, come on. Lafayette is waiting. El Trio. 50, 50 minutes. Patience. Man, I would exercise patience today. 51 minutes. You have opportunity to work on patience. You have an opportunity to work. The fruits of the Spirit are able to grow because you are with other people. And you and I have, have the opportunity. Listen, it's impossible that offenses won't come. But at least you know, I'm under the Lordship of Christ. You're under the Lordship of Christ. I'm upset with you. You're upset with me. You said this. They said that. We said this. Okay. What does the Bible say? Go to that person. Hey, listen. This went on, and uh, I, I want this right. So we learn. We're practicing we're with the same Lord. We're getting the same direction. And all of a sudden, there's, there's a unity, but not just a unity. There's a strengthening. So there's truth and growth. There's truth and growth when we assemble. When there's a fellowship, a common cause. What happened was when the Spirit of God was poured out, they came together. They, they, they were listening, but there was a fellowship. And then there was breaking of bread, which is talking about the communion and eating together. The, 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 the body of Christ, right? Okay, thank you, Lord. And so he goes on and says, and a sense of awe came over everyone. A sense of, wow. What is this? Well, it's unity. Community. Did I say unity? Community. Fellowship. Community. And that's why even what was going on this morning, the celebration of somebody else. See, celebrating myself by myself is just not so great. I don't think I've ever been moved to tears just celebrating myself by myself. <laughs> like, when I shoot a big buck, which happens very often, ask Lance Becker. <laughs> when I shoot a big buck, it's great. It Maybe sometimes too many big bucks. It's happened before, on accident. <laughs> but I, I, my, my celebration is the fact that I get to share it with somebody. I get to post or I get to text B B D. Big. That's right. And hopefully a picture will be coming right after. There's something about that being celebrating with one another. And let's keep on reading here. It says, The sense of awe came over everyone, and the apostles performed many signs and wonders. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And so I want to go to Mark chapter 4, and, and I'm going to uh, give you just, or Mark chapter 6, rather, and I'm going to give you a couple of just uh, uh, brain thoughts of a couple messages, okay, or a couple of uh, scriptures. When the woman uh, needed to, um, she was about to die, you know, her and her son, and here comes Elijah, and he's, they're, they're about their last cake, last meal, last whatever, and the man of God says, hey, but make me one first, Right? So again, first, we're going to look here at Jesus telling his disciples to do something first and how the first, every time you see this where God says, do, but do this first, but do this first, but do this first, it opened the door for signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, in Mark chapter 6, 30 through 37, it says, Meanwhile, the apostles gathered around Jesus and brought him the news of all that had happened. This is right after John the Baptist had been beheaded. Uh, this account is, is spoken of in mul multiple Gospels, okay? Um, but he says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and brought him news of all they had done and taught. Jesus, before this, not only did John the Baptist get beheaded, but he had sent his disciples out with power and authority. And so they went about, and they, they, they come back to Jesus, and they're coming back to tell him all that had been done. So they come back, and all they had done and taught, and he said to them, come away with me privately to a solitary, uh, solitary place, and let us rest for a while, for many people were coming and going so much that they couldn't even take time to eat. 
So it was super busy. So they come back together. There's all, all kinds of chaos. John has been beheaded just recently. Like, and, and actually, one of, the, one of the accounts of this is that Jesus got in the boat and to go to the other side, to go to a, solid, a, a quiet place. Kind of like when Lazarus passed away, Jesus wept. Like Jesus was touched with emotion and feeling just like us. John, that was his cousin, and, and he just has been beheaded. What a gut punch of just... Oh. And yet, here come the disciples telling of all that had just been done and all that. And it's just kind of like, wow. Like, I just, let's just, hey, I, we can't even talk right now. And, and you guys, we, we just need to go get away for a, a minute. And he says, for many people were coming and going, they had not so much eat. Verse 32. So they went away in a boat by themselves to a solitary place. But many people saw them leaving and recognized them. And so they ran together on foot around the lake, around the Sea of Galilee, how many of you know that's gonna that's that's some hunger, right? <laughs> they ran o- over there um, on foot from all the towns and arrived before Jesus did or before them. When Jesus stepped ashore and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Now I just want to paint this picture. Hey guys, let's go go get on the boat, go get on the cruise ship. We're gonna take a vacay, okay? We need a little time away. Things have been busy. You've been doing ministry. You've been doing, and you've been doing some really good things. You've taught some good. I know you've been gone, and you didn't even provide for yourself a staff or all these kind of things. And so you've been at it, you know. There's been hungry times. There's been hard times. There's been good things. But, man, we come back, and we're just, we're spent. And we're busy, and we're so spent that we don't even have time to eat. We just need to get away and, you know. So hop on the cruise ship. Go to the other side. And when Jesus gets to the other side, uh, the solitary place wasn't very solitary. There was a crowd. Now, can you imagine? Okay, I just want you to put yourself into this place. What, what, what the disciples must have been thinking and saying, hey, we're going to go alone to be with Jesus. We're going to go alone and we're going to get a little less work here. <sighs> I can get a break, right? I just need a break. I just need a break. I just need a break, okay? Okay. Um, and all of a sudden, Jesus is teaching. Peter, like, John, he loves you. Go talk to Jesus. You know, uh, you know, you can tell him things that nobody else can tell him. It's kind of like my family, when, when Samuel or Matthew want something, they say, hey, Caleb, go ask mom and dad. <laughs> hey, John. Go talk to Jesus and say, what are we doing here? And how long is this going to be? We're supposed to be going down the water slide and, you know. But Jesus, but Jesus, all of a sudden, Jesus comes to that place and he sees the, pe- the people. He sees the people. He sees the people. His eyes no longer are upon what's been going on himself, in, all on himself. He sees other people. And it, what happens is, without a shepherd, he began to teach them many things. But now, uh, the hour was late. So the disciples came to Jesus, and they told him what to do. This is a desolate place. The hour is already late. Jesus, can you tell the people to go home, Jesus? Can you, you know you're in a bad place when you're telling Jesus what to do. Jesus, um, hey, go tell them. And so you can see John up there. You know, and all the disciples behind them, because the disciples, and get them, John, tell them, tell them. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, hey, Jesus, uh, we were wondering if you could just send the people away to go uh, get them something to eat, you know, so we can, you know, relax, you know, we were supposed to, you know, we kind of already missed our opportunity here, but, you know, it's getting late, you know, now, I mean, this is what's happening here. They're not happy with Jesus, and Jesus says this. Uh, send them away. He, they said, send them away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages so they can buy themselves something to eat. And again, the American dream is about what? Yourself. And Jesus told them, and this is where I want to end, you give them something to eat. This is the fir- what he told them first. Give them something to eat. And they said, we don't have, well, you have five loaves. He said, then bring that to me. And, and then I'll pass it out and you can give them something to eat. What happened is, is when, when, when eyes got off of everything else, but it was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve that person, it opened the door for miracles. 
This is, what, this is how, how miracles happen. This is actually what uh, I wanted to get to in this series that we started la- last year at the end called Gifts, as we were coming into Christmas. And the gifts, he says that he doesn't want us ignorant about spiritual gifts. You know how the gifts of the Spirit are brought into operation? A simple word that we use all the time, thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness. Lord, What are you saying today? And you just walk through, uh, through a, a time, walk through uh, like a, a crowd. You walk through and you just say, Lord, what are you saying? Who do you want to touch? Who do you want to restore? Like you just ask, ask the Lord, how can I be a blessing? And this is the thing. So many times we're trying to tap something that is not our gift, but God has given you gifts. Ephesians chapter 4, if you'll put it up there, I'm not going to go back to my notes, but Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse maybe like 7, maybe it's, maybe it's up a little higher than that. Uh, we'll give, we'll, um, he talks about how he's given us a gift. So here's the deal. He's given you a gift. So use your gift. Don't use Pastor Nate's gift. Don't use Ben's gift. Don't use Ev's gift. Use your gift. Use your gift. And that word gift is, is the word Grace. Oops, that was my phone. That's all right. Cases work. Look at here. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Um, Verse 7. So, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So you have a gift. You have a grace. You have a gift that God wants to use to do what? To build up his body. So how do I I tap those things? I I think, how can I, knowing the grace that's been given to me, this is why it's so important for you to identify and say what God says about you. You use that gift, you use that grace, and that grace is engaged or that grace is activated, that gift from Christ himself becomes activated when you and I simply think about being thoughtful. Some of you, 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 you could, you, you, the gift of prophecy, which the Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and not verse 13, or 1 Corinthians 12 before the love chapter, that he tells us to desire that we would prophesy. He tells us that. But you know, you know some of you, it just takes you open in your mouth to say what God, and this is prophecy right here, ready? Saying what God says. Saying what God says. Did you know you could prophesy to somebody to something comes up in your heart concerning uh, just a scripture? Yeah, I just wanted to come and tell you that God's causing all things to work together for good, for your good. Like you had that scripture pop up and you're like, Lord, I got that scripture. Am I supposed to share that with somebody today? Yeah, I'll show you who. Okay, cool. And now I can say what God says. And, and I don't have to, and I just, God, God wanted me to tell you this today. I'm telling you, oh, I, I wish I wouldn't have took a, a left turn there maybe because of just where I was trying, trying to go. But I'm telling you, it's time that we start thinking about others. We start saying, saying instead of thinking about myself, I start thinking about others and this fellowship and this common unity where God is working to build up his body. He's working Ephesians chapter two. Let me, let me just go through a couple of things today so to where you can see that God introduces the body of Christ. Verses 11, Ephesians 2, 11. Remember that formerly you were Gentiles, you and I, we were in this place uh, as Gentiles. We weren't Jews. We had no covenant with God. There was no hope for us. Okay? So we weren't even God's people, but we were Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcised or no covenant. At that time, you were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise. We were without hope. We, are without, we, were, we were without God. But now, the Bible says in verse 13, Ephesians 2, in Christ Jesus you who were once afar off have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So he says, remember, that you had no covenant, you had no hope. I want you to remember this. This is how the body of Christ and the fellowship started. 
He, he, Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus how, how you and I were grafted in and how, how there was something that was started right here. This is the first place we see the mention and the start or the birth or the rearing up of the body of Christ, the, the growing, the, begin, the beginning growth of the body of Christ. So you were, you were far away but brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Whose peace? Our peace. First Baptist peace. Pentecost peace. The world's peace. Those without covenant, Jesus Christ is our peace. There's a message in there that we're again hungering after righteousness, God's way, which is building up his body, what he's about. He introduces it here. He says, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has torn down the dividing wall of hostility. This right here is not talking about hostility between God and man. He did that at the cross. He's talking about making two one. There's no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor, nor Gentile. There's not. There's not. There, there's one. There's one man. So God didn't just make you, when the Bible says that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, God took all of man and he made out of, out of many one. Out of many he made one. Out of many, he made one. So this is why what's so important for you and I to understand that Mark, maybe part of the reason that you and I are hurting is because they're hurting. And because they're hurting, I'm hurting. Doesn't this sound like scripture? It sounds like Corinthians a little bit, like how each part, when one part suffers, all of it suffers. This is the, this is the introduction. He says, he himself is our peace who made, made the two into one. He tore down the wall of hostility by abolishing his, in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees, and he did this to create in himself one new man out of two. Out of the world, or Gentiles, those have, and the people of God. One new man, which is what? Thus making peace and reconciling both of them to God in one body through the cross by which he extinguished their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who, far, who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. This is the introduction right here of God taking that which was divided, the world, and his people who had a covenant, and bringing them to into one, into one body, the body of Christ, because of Jesus. This is the start of it. So if you believed on Jesus, it was because, or if you, if you were born again, it's because Jesus was your peace, and Jesus was their peace, and Jesus was... So there's this, there's this common fellowship. There's this un, un, uniting. There's a fellowship. There's a relationship. There's a unity. There's a community that, that God has designed his body to have. The word ecclesia, which means we see the word church, which is trans, we translate in English church, but in the, in the Greek it's ecclesia, which is uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, a political party or a group, a sect of people that are pushing a narrative or an agenda. So you and I, there's a common unity. Listen, God's agenda, because we have been made peace just like us here at Beyond have been made in peace because of Jesus over there in Kentucky, down the road. There's, there's this peace because of Jesus. And so, guess what? God's message is going forth and our body, the hands and feet, are working there. So, Father, thank you for that they're working there. And maybe it would cause you and me to go, Father, thank you. How can they be working here? And, Lord, what do you, how do you want to do this here? And, how, how, and I'm thinking now not about me. I'm thinking about them. I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about them. First Corinthians, I want, to, I want you to see this, because, and, and I know it's 11.30 here, so the body is a unit. Those are, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. The body is a unit. Though it's composed of many parts, and though its parts are many, they all form one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. For the body does not consist of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, make, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, that would, make it, would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were in the eye, 
Where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? In fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, according to his design. God has arranged. So this is why, why it's so important for you and I to be in the place that God's called us to be in the church. This is why, according to Hebrews chapter 10, that as you see the day approaching, it's so important that we would be assembled or we'd be in that place. Why? Because there's a supply that I'm to bring. I'm, the, there's, I, I'm a connector. And anytime a connection is made, there's something that's to flow to me, but it's not just a dead end here. It's to flow through me. There's, there's this, this connection. So it's so important as the body of Christ that we are connected. How? God's design. God's design. Being connected and not exchanging comfort and convenience for that of truth and growth. And we would be in a place of fellowship where there would be a common unity where God said, hey, I want you to use your gift, your grace to build up the body and I want you to practice in the house and I want you to take it outside of the house. That kind of sounds like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, that tells us that in that same chapter where he said he gave everybody gifts, how God went and gave, Christ himself gave gifts, and he gave unto us apostle, teacher, prophet, evangelist, pastor. Why? Verse 12, for the perfecting or the equipping, or that word, if you were to look this up in the Greek, the word for the, to equip, it means to make everything into a, alignment so it functions right. That you look, go look that up in the Strong's. It's, it's so where everything, it's now, it all works. It's going like this. He says, these are for that, so that the people to equip or to make his people ready and everything in order in, in you, so you can do your works of service. Or this, if you were to look this in the King James, it says ministry. You know what? You have a ministry. You're a minister. What's your ministry? And what's your minist what, what are you to minister about? So that the body of Christ will be built up. I have a fellowship. So, so though I'm Pastor Nate, you know what? I'm more, hey, let's go build up the body. Let's go. Hey, let's go love on somebody today. Let's go. Let, I mean, I'm going to use my gift. And when we come together, God's going to give a, a grace to a, a pastor to not just bring his own thoughts, but go back and say, God, what are you saying today? And how could it help and equip? And the Holy Spirit, where I'm going to miss it and I'm going to throw it over here, he's going to take that curveball and make it hit because he accompanies God's word. And so what you even listen to here, you're not listening just to a pastor. You're listening to the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit's taking that Word and driving it supernaturally into the human heart, you, a, a part of the body of Christ, an ear, a finger, or whatever. Why? So that you can be equipped, perfected, made, made completely ready for what? The work of ministry that God has called you to do, which is to build up the body of Christ, to assemble. I'm telling you, God's coming back for a glorious church. There is a fellowship that you and I have. There's a fellowship that we have in this, in this community. There's a fellowship that a believer has, and that is we are build, to build up and to carry a message. To carry a message of what? Hey, this is the message. You were once far off. Maybe you're far off now. But Jesus, God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to, to make a way where you couldn't. This is the message that we carry. The good news of the gospel. Jesus paid the price for me, for you. He loves you. And I begin to think that that way, and he says if you just would just surrender to his, to his love and his lordship, you, you too, we could go and we could, we could, you could come and hook up and there would be a flow. And it's not just to me to pray a prayer for you, with you, but to really, it's not just, it's the assimilation. God, God, God's all about assimilating. This is why it's so important. We are a relational church. His church is a relational church. There's, there's not just a transaction. Yep, Sunday morning, check. Did my, did my deal. Here, you know what we're going to do? It starts at what time? Well, worship usually doesn't start. Doesn't, uh, we'll just come in. We'll get there about 1045. Because then Pastor Nate will be about starting his, done with his review. And we'll catch this part. And we can get out 
because we got this at this time. And I'm not ta- tagging you. If I'm not tagging you if you came and ran late. This is not about that. I'm talking to the church here. That that there is something about coming and saying, I got something to bring to somebody today. I have I have something to bring to somebody today. Lord, show me how to be. There's something about that assimilation. And what happens is there's this a great exchange, but not only that, there's truth and growth in that place. And we're equipped in that place for our works of ministry, which is the same work. We all doing the same thing, which is what? Building up the body of Christ by carrying a message. So what am I dreaming about? I've been, I've, we've been talking about this. Uh, me, and my, me and Ev have been talking about this a lot lately. As a, as a church, what are we dreaming about? What am I dreaming about? Lord, what's your dreams for Beyond Church? What are you, what are you saying? And it c- keeps coming back down to simply, is simply this. Building up the body. Assimilate the body. Rela- re- relationally, not just, but just, just bringing people into their place. The, the, the call of God on people's lives. Destinies, why you know, do you know why you were here? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's let's stand. Thank you, Lord. First Peter four seven. The end is, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear minded and be sober, so that you can pray and above all, love one another deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without complaining. Isn't that the place that we seem like the most complaining comes when I have to serve? Show hospitality without, to one another without complaining. As good stewards of the manifold or many-sided grace of God, each of you should use whatever gift God has given to you to serve one another. If anyone speaks or has the gift to speak, he should speak as the one conveying the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should serve with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever and ever. The Bible tells us when we lift him up, when he's glorified, he draws men to repentance. There's something about you and me coming together and serving one another. We learn our layups. We learn. This is our opportunity for you and I to practice and and to let the, the love and the work of God be worked in here and grow in here and taken out there. Fellowship. Common fellowship. Father, thank you so much today for calling us, for calling your people. Thank you that you're building up your body. Father, thank you that you right now, even in this time, you are pouring out your spirit upon all flesh. Father, we just say thank you for that. Thank you for pouring out your spirit upon all flesh. We just even, we even ask you for that. Lord, thank you for pouring out your spirit in, 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 in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank you for pouring out your spirit on the people, on the sons and the daughters and our children in, in Alma, in Fort Smith, in the River Valley, in, in, in Arkansas. Father, thank you for pouring out your spirit in this nation. Father, thank you for pouring out your spirit in, uh, around the world. Father, thank you for, for, for that you said you would pour out your spirit. We say thank you for that this morning. Pour it out on us. Pour it out on us to see your body built, to see lives. Find your son, Jesus. Let let us make an appeal with you right with us. The decisions would be made for eternity. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. You said that these signs would follow those that believe, that they would would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. 
You said that they would uh, cast out demons. They would cast out oppre- the, that which is oppressive. Amen. Father, thank you. You have many hands in this place. Holy Spirit, you be our teacher. Teach us what we haven't been taught before. That there's not a formula, but just a yielding, a coming under, an acknowledging that we're your children and we can be led by your spirit. We are led by you. So, Father, we thank you that you're pouring out your spirit. But we just say, lead. Lead us. Father, lead us today. Lead us in a way of of first. Lead us in a way where we're looking out at, 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 at the people. And, Father, I thank you for signs and wonders and all of those things following. The same example that you set at the start of your church. The gathering, the fellowship, the eating, the relationship, and a sense of awe, and signs and wonders and miracles, and many, many, many were added to the church, to your body. Thank you, Lord. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you, you, you've you think that there's a separation between you and the Lord. Let me tell you, Jesus came to close that gap. Jesus came to close that gap. If that's you today and you don't know, if, if, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've never surrendered your heart to him, I want to give you an opportunity right now. There's a great opportunity. You can do this anywhere, but right now would be a great opportunity, a great time where you would just make a declaration with what you believe in your heart, say, saying, God, I, I, want, I want what Jesus did for me to close that gap. If you're here and you, you've never been born again, you've never given your life to Jesus, why don't you just lift your hand right, right now where you're at. It might be online. I know we're doing this online a whole lot better than we've been. Maybe that's where you're at right now. Just, just lift your hands right there where you're sitting, whether it's in your car or in your living room, and just lift your hands to him and just repeat this after me. You might even be rededicating your life. Let me tell you, sometimes it's the conviction our hearts are convicted, but, we, but the, Holy, the Holy Spirit's not the condemner. He's the one that brings conviction so you and I can, can make a decision. I'll tell you, yield to that conviction today and just, just pray a prayer uh, and a prayer of, of consecration to Him and trust in Jesus, not in yourself. I'm condemned when I trust my strength, but I'm restored when I trust in Jesus's. And so I'll just lead you in this prayer. Say, Father, today I trust and I believe on the work of your son Jesus for my salvation. I surrender my life to your lordship. Graft me in. Set me in the body. Join me in the fellowship with the message of your love through your son Jesus. Thank you for paying the price by dying on the cross for my sins. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.